In 1795, Count Rumford visited England. As usual, he promoted his soup kitchens relentlessly. His ideas attracted considerable attention. It seemed that the new soup kitchen model had arrived in Britain at the perfect time. However, there was a huge gap in opinion and experience between those who set up soup kitchens in England and those who were forced to use them. For much of Britain's labouring population, the 1790s would have been characterised by extreme hunger and unimaginable poverty. 1794 was incredibly dry, and the following winter was amongst the coldest in the 18th century. As a result, huge quantities of crops failed, and wheat prices shot up dramatically. The inflation caused by weather fluctuations continued throughout the decade. Like today, rises in food prices affected the poor disproportionately. Working people spent a far higher percentage of their income on food. It's been suggested that some families would spend up to 50% of their wages on bread. People would have been aware that the hardship they faced was not being shared by the ruling classes. Ultimately, this led to widespread discontent, which was manifested in a good deal of revolutionary feeling in large parts of the country. There had been 16 significant riots in July and August of 1795 alone, and all of these were attributed to the rising cost of bread. Food shortages would have been seen to pose a very real threat to the ruling classes, and not least in the aftermath of the French Revolution. Rumford's soup kitchen model thus appeared at the perfect time in Britain. Cheap soup seems to offer the most cost-effective way to quell the anger of the hungry masses. London magistrate Patrick Cahoon has been described as the most vocal supporter of the new soup kitchens in England. He had a significant influence on the establishment of several of the country's first soup houses in the 1790s, and published a pamphlet with a suitably catchy title, which specified in great detail how these new establishments should be run. We must remember that soup kitchens would have operated differently across the country. However, Cahoon's writings were influential, and therefore serve as a good starting point for understanding how and why soup kitchens were being implemented in England. The English kitchens largely mirrored the model that Rumford had proposed, but with a few key differences. Firstly, soup kitchens were seen to be a valuable tool for influencing patterns of consumption. It was believed that recipients of soup would be impressed at its costs and quality. The establishments would thus serve to teach the poor to feed themselves in a more frugal manner, ensuring they weren't wasting their money on luxuries like bread in a time of crisis. Secondly, soup kitchens would not be linked to workhouses like in Germany, and were intended to only operate in the winter months rather than year-round. The most notable difference, though, was that the food offered would not be free, but instead supplied at a discount, usually around half the cost of production. These last changes seem to have been provoked by worries over creating a reliance on charity, and this is a key theme in British discourses around poverty from the 18th and 19th centuries. To understand how poverty was conceived at the time, it's helpful to briefly look at how earlier forms of charity had functioned in Britain. In the medieval period, poverty was often seen as an unavoidable fact of life. Although assistance was in many ways insufficient in this period, the aid that was provided was diverse and tended to be distributed relatively liberally. Relief was usually motivated by religious doctrine and often took the form of cash payments. It's been estimated that arms payments often made up around 10% of monasteries' expenditure in the 14th century. Offering leftover food to the poor was also an established tradition, especially amongst the aristocracy or wealthier members of the community. Additionally, the poor might have access to communal gardens or common grazing rights. They also often had the right to gleaning. This was the practice of collecting loose ears of grain after a field had been harvested. Despite this, we shouldn't present medieval Britain as an egalitarian utopia. It certainly wasn't. Assistance was for the most part incredibly limited, and malnutrition and starvation would not be uncommon. However, as poverty was conceived as an unavoidable evil, there were a range of diverse measures that provided assistance. And although they were insufficient, Acts of charity were generally looked upon favourably and were not stigmatised. By the 18th century though, this had changed. There was now a far greater emphasis placed on personal responsibility for poverty. It was not a fact of life, but a result of a person's choices or moral failings. As a result, charity became heavily stigmatised and policymakers were worried that misapplied charity demoralised the poor and created a dangerous class of welfare-dependent paupers 
adept at manipulating the system. In practice, this meant it became far less common for wealthier members of the community to indiscriminately distribute food to the poor. While this older tradition of charity did continue, it was utterly eclipsed by the more structured and strict forms of aid like workhouses and soup kitchens. The model of Cahoon's soup kitchens was intended to ensure that aid only reached the truly deserving. In order to receive soup, you'd first need a ticket which proved that you were truly in need. The kitchen's finances would be supplied by roughly 500 annual subscribers, and it was specified that every one of these who donated more than half a guinea would receive six tickets to distribute as they wished. Rather than donating money to the poor directly, or offering it in good faith to an institution, Benefactors were now able to essentially buy the right to decide who was worthy of receiving soup charity. Cahoon had claimed that the church was incapable of the responsible management of charity, but his model allowed anyone who could afford it to play a role in the management of the soup kitchen. In essence, this model created shareholders, but in this case, investment would not return profits, but instead tokens, which enabled exactly six acts of benevolence. Accessing emergency food was a fairly tedious process through the soup kitchen. The first step was receiving a ticket which entitled you and sometimes your family to a portion of soup. You'd then have to show up to the kitchen, usually between 11 and 1 o'clock in the daytime. As many recipients were in full-time employment, it was common practice to send children to collect soup. You'd then face a considerable wait, between 1 and 3 hours in most cases. The lines at soup kitchens were notoriously long, and you might well be forced to stand outside in the cold if you turned up slightly late. The maze queues that we often find in airports and banks today were actually first implemented in soup kitchens. They were used as a way to ensure customers remained passive and orderly, as well as giving the illusion of a shorter waiting time. When you finally got to the front of the line, you'd show your ticket and pay for some soup that would look something like this. Although most soup kitchens would not provide tables or bowls and would require you to take your meal home. Despite the degrading treatment and poor quality food that would be found in soup kitchens, their supporters were incredibly proud of the new institutions. One committee boasted of the incalculable advantages which must result from producing so salutary a change in the habits of the lower classes. Some commentators though did see this extreme pride to be misplaced. As William Wordsworth wrote, the evil would be less regretted if these institutions were regarded only as palliatives to a disease, but the vanity and pride of their promoters are so subtly interwoven with them that they are deemed great discoveries and blessings to humanity. It's considerably harder to know what the users of the soup kitchens might have thought of the establishments, as their voices are largely absent from the historical record. Obviously, these discounted meals would have prevented some people from starving, so we should not dismiss the soup kitchens as completely useless. But, evidence suggests they were despised by those who were forced to make use of them. The food served in soup kitchens was of far lower quality than reported in the recipes of the time. Long periods of boiling turned any meat into a nondescript, amalgous mush, and this seems to have allowed scrupulous shop owners to serve otherwise inedible scraps to their hungry customers. Peter Pindar offers an extreme example of this practice in a satirical piece of poetry written in 1801. He writes, Some blessed with stupendous power shall change old shoes to beef in half an hour, and turn amidst the wonders of the shop the tinker's apron to a mutton chop. Another example can be found in the lyrics of a Newcastle folk song which jokes about the poor quality of the soup kitchen food. A skipper and his wife sat down to give a quarter dry, when something stuck in Molly's throat and choked her very nigh. Poor Molly blared and turned quite pale, and out she poured a great rat's tail. It's unclear if leather shoes, aprons and rats were being regularly boiled and served, but the point is that soup kitchens allowed almost anything to be added to the kettle, and some shop owners certainly would have been taking advantage of this. To their supporters, soup kitchens seemed to be a miracle cure for the social issues present in England in the 1790s. They could cheaply prevent revolution, influence habits of consumption, and perhaps most importantly, make sure that charity didn't reach the undeserving.
Their popularity would continue to grow over the course of the 19th century, and by 1888 there were over 200 soup kitchens in London alone. <laughs>